Well, I'm, I'm uh, honored to uh, be here today and, uh, and a little bit humbled uh, to be asked to talk about um, my life and uh, the kinds of things that go on in a life in the arts. Um, I came up in Detroit. I started my band, the MC5, in Detroit in the 1960s. Um, I doubt that many of you know who the MC5 is. Can I see a show of hands? Anyone ever heard of the MC5? That's better than I thought. <laughs> Shows you're astute uh, students of contemporary culture. Um, the MC5 was a uh, very hard rock band, two guitars, bass, and drums, and very aggressive music. We were uh, we came from the world of Chuck Berry and the instrumental bands, and we discovered the free jazz movement of Sun Ra and John Coltrane, and we started to incorporate that into the rock music we were playing, and, and we were uh, overtly political. Um, my friend Tom Morello from Rage Against the Machine either credits me or blames me, I'm not sure, for uh, his political activism. Uh, and the MC5 uh, burned fast and burned bright and burned out. Crashed and burned early. By 72, it was all over. Um, I went on a road to ruin, personally. Went right down the drain. Uh, became a drug addict, a criminal, an alcoholic. Ended up going to federal prison for a couple years. Came out started to build a life back together, got sober. And today I live in Los Angeles and I have a wonderful life. I compose music for film and television mostly, but I still play in bands. I still tour. I'm still a political radical. Uh, I'm still an activist. Um, I score a show for HBO today called Eastbound and Down. And I think, I think those guys are the only guys crazy enough to hire the likes of me. So uh, that's, you know, that's, that's my arc that gets me here today. You know, I find I'm, I'm 61 years old, and I know a little bit about what it means to be uh, in the arts and the entertainment industry. And it is an industry. We're in the amusement industry. I, I call my... Uh, my production company, Industrial Amusement, because uh, th that's really uh, what we do. I'm curious, how, of all of you guys, how many of you are, see yourselves on the performance side or the artist side of, of this deal? And then am I safe to assume that the rest of you are, see yourselves on the business side? Yeah? Pretty much? Is there any other sides? Did I miss something? The middle. The middle. Artist, businessman? I think you're hitting on it there. Because if you, if you are an artist, um, you have to be a businessman or business person. Um, because otherwise, you won't be able to sustain a career uh, in film, dance, art, photography, music. You have to know your rights. You have to know the law. You have to know business. You have to know copyright. You have to know contracts. Otherwise, you end up like so many of my contemporaries, bitter, broke, destitute. Um, and and uh, I think that there's a, a line that we sell in Hollywood, and we sell it to you guys mostly. And it's the idea that uh, if you have that hit show, that hit book, that hit record, uh, that you'll be delivered to the good life that you see on MTV and magazines. And uh, that's a lie. That is a huge, bold-faced lie. And uh, we marketed it pretty successfully. Um, 
Oftentimes when people decide to be musicians, at least, you know, I decided to be a musician because I needed something. I needed more. I needed more attention. I don't know if my mother didn't love me enough or what, but I got it on stage. I could go up on stage and I could entertain people with my guitar and I could sing and dance and people f kind of were attracted to that. And uh, I don't know if that's such a healthy mental state. Um, the point being that if something's wrong with you uh, and you think that success is going to cure you or you're going to be okay once you get that hit record, uh, I'm here to tell you, not only will it not cure you, it'll make you worse. You'll be worse. And, and then you end up with me and all my friends in Alcoholics Anonymous. I see it in Los Angeles all the time. Uh, people that have a plan. I got a plan. The plan is I'm going to be a big success. And they work real hard. And they come to great colleges. And they learn a bunch of stuff. And they get out there. And they do whatever they got to do. And they're successful. And they don't feel better about it. In fact, they feel worse. And then they discover the wonderful pain-killing properties of Jack Daniels and heroin. And then if they're lucky, they don't die and they can recover, and they can learn how to live without drugs and alcohol. And then you can get on to the business of, of living a life in the arts. So my experience has been in these kind of situations, I'm better off listening to you guys, because I think you have more questions. And uh, so what I'd like to do is just kind of have more of a discussion, more of a conversation about about what, you know, what's the deal? And I'll tell you as best I can. I may not have um, a great answer, but it'll be the best answer I can come up with, and it'll be the truth. So if you've got, if you've got something on your mind, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to talk about it. One of the things uh, you sort of mentioned in passing several times now is uh, a career in the arts, but it is an industry, it's a business, it's a job. Uh, where do you draw the line between arts, entertainment, or how are they related? How's that line been blurred? But you clearly have uh, a well thought out relationship with the two. I think the arts are entertaining. I, I think art, uh, what we do what people, humans on Earth, have done with art from the beginning is we tell our own stories. And if we do it in dance, or we do it in photography, or we do it in screenwriting, or we do it in music, uh, we're telling the stories of people, what people go through. And as people, we find that entertaining. <laughs> we like to hear about ourselves, because I believe it confirms um, our humanity and makes, when I listen to James Brown, I say, that, that's what I'm talking about. That's me. He's singing that song for me to me because that's what I'm talking about. He's connecting, I'm connecting with him and I feel less alone. I think that's what art does for us. And, you know, I mean, we can, we can talk about uh, entertainment and, it, you know, some of it's kind of frivolous and some of it's not very good. But I think that's fundamentally what happens there, is, is it's a, it's a co connection between people. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not conflicted about, you know, the difference between art and entertainment. I think some's better than others, but I think that's the general dynamic. How, um, do you have any recommendations or ways in how to grow musically and from a business standpoint simultaneously? Like, to me, the... Um, sort of the ultimate example of someone growing as a musician and a, and a businessman at the same time is Ian Mackay from uh, Minor Thread and Pagazi who started Discord Records sort of in flux with himself as a musical artist. Do you have any recommendations of how to, you know, to let those growths support one another as you, as you uh, progress? Yeah, Ian's terrific. He's uh, a friend of mine. And, and uh, I, think, I think it's a, it's a um, 
it's a line that, that's all about continued education of, of, the, of, a, of an open mind. Like, what is an open mind? You know, I used to think I had an open mind because um, I had gay friends and leftist political ideas and I believed in UFOs. I thought that was open mind. That's not an open mind. Open mind is no preconceived ideas so that I can be exposed to something and it just lays on my mind and I don't have to make a decision about it. I just let it lay there. I can make a decision later, but don't make the decision now. Let information come in and actually go seek information. So this is all the education. In a lot of ways, what we do, we're in the idea business. And ideas have to come in, get processed, so they can go back out. So I have to be exposed to more kinds of music. I have to continue to learn. I'm still in school. I go to school now. I want to write for the orchestra. I have to do what every other composer that writes for the orchestra does. I have to go to school. I have to learn the language of the orchestra. I don't know. You know, Marcato from Pizzicato. I don't know, you know, how, where you put the brass, where you put the violins. I've got to learn these things like everybody else. So I go to school. You know, I'm in school when I'm playing with other musicians and somebody knows a chord progression and I don't know it. Hey man, show me how you did that. You know, it's, it's being humble enough to ask someone to help me. Uh, and on the business side, it, the, kind of the same principle applies, you know, to figure out, well, how did this guy get his record label going? You know, what was the process that he went through? Did he have to register a copyright? Did he have to get a bank loan? You know, did he have to get a distributor? I mean, it, this is an educational process. As you go along, you start to acquire more information and more practical, usable knowledge. Um, you start to kind of understand um, the framework that you're navigating in. Like my wife is a music publisher and she does she has a business where she licenses music to the movie trailer industry. She's educated herself to become a publishing expert. She knows everything there is. She knows more about publishing way more than I know. I got to go to her, Margaret, how does this work? <laughs> but that's an ongoing living life process, I think. Yeah, man. Um, when, when you were part of the, the MC Pod, what, what point do you think you made the transition from being in like a, a band with your friends and just kind of like to or becoming part of like a movement and being connected to something greater at the time? It was a particular point in American history. Um, where everyone of my generation, when, we, when I was your age, all of my generation st stood against the war in Vietnam, stood for civil rights. And the, two, the, the consciousness was unified um, in a powerful way because of the draft, mostly. The draft polarized everybody you, because you had to deal with it and it wasn't a joke. They were going to forcibly put you in the army and send you to the other side of the world to kill or be killed with people that have nothing to do with us. Sounds familiar. Uh, so at, a, you know, at an age, this all happened at an age, about 18 is when you had to go file for your selective service and take the physical and all that. So at, at about that age, I started to have the sense that you know, students in Paris were burning down the Sorbonne, <laughs> students in Mexico City were rioting and taking over universities, at Columbia, in Ann Arbor where I lived, and there was a sense that this was a, a larger thing than just us individually or just me as a guy in a band and that I was part of something bigger. But it, it was around the age of 18 and probably around 1968, 69, but it was, I think, a unique time in history. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if that same thing exists today. And hopefully it, that kind of thing wouldn't happen again, but history tends to repeat itself. Yeah. Um, 
something you talked about was, um, I guess, being a musician and how um, a lot of times being a, performing on stage is like fulfilling sort of an ego or a um, self fulfillment of some kind. I was wondering what kind of your process in terms of getting past that and getting to a point of just, cause like you say, you compose now just a, a point of art rather than um, an ego fulfillment. Yeah, 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 yeah. The ego. <laughs> <laughs> um, ego is a funny thing because it exists below the level of consciousness. I mean, I never sat around and said, you know, I'm better than everybody else. I'm a better guitar player than all these other guys. But I felt that way. It's not a conscious thought I had. So I get on stage and I think I'm better at this than everybody else is. It's, that's the ego. And that gets me in trouble because I'm waiting for that ego fulfillment. I'm waiting for that applause. I'm waiting for people to tell me I'm cool. And then when they do, I feel like, OK, everything's right. Everything's right with the world. This is exactly as I planned it. I read an article in a magazine says, Wayne Kramer and his band, the MC5, they're the real deal, and yada, yada. They're the greatest thing since sliced bread, and real rock. And, and I say, yeah, that's it. See, I told you. The, the, tr the trouble with ego is <clears throat> when they say you suck. And you believe it because you read it the first time. You say, well, that's right, you know. But then you got to believe it when they say you suck. And then it, it, you're crushed. Your heart's, my heart's broken. And um, I, I wasn't aware of any of this when it happened. I was your age. And I, you know, I, when somebody wrote something in the newspaper about me, I thought that was true. I thought it was a meritocracy. I thought they wrote stuff in the newspapers about you because you were exceptionally talented, or you were exceptionally gifted, or, or intelligent, or uh, witty, or something, good looking. That's why they wrote about you. And I was all those things <laughs> in my mind. Um, I didn't, I didn't know that um, records are marketed by record companies who hire publicists to call up their friends who are writers and journalists and fly them on junkets out to hear your band. And then they, in return, write a nice story about you. I never knew that. I thought they wrote good stuff about you because you were, you were worth it. Um, and, and that same ego. That, that, I, that, you know, that propelled me out there, that made me think I could do this. That same ego that, uh, that got crushed when I read bad reviews is also the ego that sought refuge in drugs and alcohol. See, there's one way to, to not feel all tore up about bad reviews is get loaded. It, it works for a while. Um, what I got to is an awareness that um, I'm not my job. I'm, I'm not, you know, what I do in the world, that's, in, that's my living. My, my life is who I am as a, as a human being, the man I represent myself to be. That's who I am. And I work in, in an industry. And I am actually a worker amongst workers. For me, that's the best way for me to deal with ego, that I get up in the morning and I go do a certain kind of work. I'm, uh, it, some, of the, some of it comes easy to me. You know, some people can draw. Some people are good with other people. Some people are good with numbers. Music comes easy to me. So I, 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 I have some facility with it. Um, that doesn't make me better than everybody else. That's just my job. So the way I try to live my life today is that I'm a worker amongst workers. I do a particular kind of job. It's an honorable job. It fits into the culture and, and the makeup of human beings in, a, in I think, an important way. And, uh, and that's enough. That's enough for me. It, it doesn't define me who I am. When people are clapping, when I'm on the gig and I finish, uh, maybe I play a solo and everybody claps, or I finish the tune and everybody claps, I enjoy the clapping. But it's only good while they're clapping. <laughs> Once they stop clapping, that's it. There's nothing else to it. So. Uh, you're talking about how the MC5 um, kind of quickly burn out. Are there ways, um, I guess, just that you've seen where you kind of avoid that burnout with band stuff? Because you see it happen so often. 
Yeah, it's, it's uh, I, I tend to look at it as, um, in nature, all things that are conceived, born, grow, flower, wither, and die. <laughs> it's just the cycle of nature. And in the arts, it's the same kind of thing, basically. Anytime a group of people get together for common purpose, whether it's to form a dance troupe or a magazine or a theater company or a photography club or a band, you can, if you get a few people working together, you can accomplish some things. You can, and oftentimes you'll accomplish your goals. Um, but the center never holds. How things are today, they won't be like this five years from now. Everything will be different. Things fall apart. And same thing happens with most bands. That's the arc with most, most bands get somewhere, maybe they get a deal, they make a couple records, and then it's all over. I mean, if you think of how many bands there have been since, in the modern era of electric rock type bands, since the Beatles, say since the 60s, it's thousands, maybe tens of thousands. How many does anyone remember, you know? <laughs> so it's part of the deal is one way to look at it. The, the other part, I think to, to sustain is almost impossible. I mean, there's only one Bruce Springsteen. There's only one R.E.M. Even those bands have had changes of personnel. Um, I, I, put, I put the odds at about 100,000 to one that a band can sustain over a lifetime. You know, Rolling Stones. There aren't, there aren't very many. Because um, there's, there's just so many pressures and so, many, so much pushing and pulling on a band you know, you get together when you're young and you're unified and you say, well, we're going to do this. It's us against the world. We're going to make it. And then maybe you make it. And then it's, well, now I've got a wife. I've got kids. I uh, think I want to do something else. Uh, everybody starts to get pulled in different directions. It's very hard. Um, there are, st I, I, I would think that the, the wisest course is to approach it as, um, and I know this is a, sounds sinful, but as business-like as you can, which is almost like antithetical to the idea of having a band. Tom Morello tells me all the time that Rage Against the Machine are fragile. It's a fragile band. So these record company guys always want him to put out another, great, put out a greatest hits, or let's do a photo session. He said, no, guys, go away. Leave the band alone. If you leave us alone, we'll be all right. If you start trying to make us do something, you'll break the band up. I mean, that's you know kind of how fragile they, bands can be. But if you can be business-like about it, if you can have uh, um, agreements in place that clearly define everybody's role, if somebody wants to leave the band, here's what you'll end up with. How does the songwriting break out? This is how it would work. I think those kinds of understandings can, can be helpful in at least maintaining the business structure, because this is a business, and people are, you know, if you're in the band, you're, try, you're depending on this to pay your rent and pay your mortgage and pay, hopefully pay your kids through college. And so I think it's, it's helpful to have uh, as much structure as you can have in a band. But it's, you know, it's like, it's like marrying four or five people. I mean, it's hard for a man and a woman to stay married sometimes, let alone four or five people. It's, it's just very difficult. You're, you're, it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough road to hoe. <laughs> um, what did you do to get back on your feet after uh, you know, burnout or whatever? Uh, Two of the guys in the MC5 died at 46. They drank themselves to death. Never survived being in the MC5. And it was a wake-up call for me that, you know, if I was going to do anything with the time that I have on this mortal plane, I better get to work. And I, I better, you know, use, 
I better start planning my time because <laughs> it's going to run out, you know. It's something I never thought of when I was your age because I was absolutely certain of everything. I had everything dialed. I knew everything. I had all the answers. And I was going to live forever. Today, I'm absolutely certain uh, I'm not living forever. And I know less than, way less than I thought I knew. <laughs> and I know less about more things. <laughs> so I think once I realized that my time was the most valuable thing I had, and it, and it was finite, then I could start to, you know, on a daily basis, say, OK, what am I doing today that's going to, you know, like I have goals. You know, I want to score feature films. Uh, I've, I've got, I've done uh, nine solo albums, you know. I'd like to do nine more before I go. That means, what did I write today, <laughs> you know? I got to write something every day. I got I to gotta move something up the court every day. I got to be on my job every day. It, it, that's really it. it was, it's the certainty of death that motivates me. <laughs> Somebody else had their hand up over here. Um, you kind of touched on this, but um, besides like a, a, a really healthy everyday getting work done, um, how did you get started in such a competitive one of the most competitive, you know, businesses around, like the arts in LA. You know, how'd you go from um, playing music in Detroit to now, you know, working in that environment? Um, well, I, I brought some professional cachet with me. I mean, the albums I made in the MC5, uh, you know, people in the business know about the MC5 because they're all aficionados of, of music. So when I, when I arrived in LA, I've been there 16 years. I got there the early 90s, 93, 94. Um, I knew some people would know who I am, so I went around knocking on doors at, at indie record companies and major labels and seeing if anybody wanted to make Wayne Kramer records. I don't know any other way to do it, you know. Hi, it's Wayne Kramer. <laughs> what are you doing for lunch? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got something I want to talk to you about. And you know, I I demoed up some songs. I w I had been living in Nashville, so um, I, I'm a, in my years, the intervening years after prison, I uh, learned to trade. Uh, I became a cabinet maker, so I'd still play in bands and and produce bands but I could work during the day in a cabinet shop and I could survive. Because, you know, being in the MC5 didn't leave me independently wealthy. <laughs> and, uh, and gigs were, you know, a career as a guitar player. In, I was living in New York City. A freelance guitar player is very tough. And sometimes you got a gig and sometimes you're playing and sometimes you're not. And I just got sick of the poor periods, so I took a day job. I always, I always kind of looked down my nose at people that had day jobs. You know, I thought, well, if he could play, he wouldn't need a day job. That the ego again. That, that's a, and then I realized, you know, I can play and I need a day job because I'm starving. Um, so I was in Nashville. I made these demos. I took them to LA with me, and I was able to interest Brett Gerowitz at Epitaph Records. I mean, he understood the, the legacy of the MC5. He could see that I was sober. I was ready to work. I had some good songs. So he wanted to take a chance on me. I made four albums for Epitaph. Everything I do helps everything else I do. So you know, I was able to parlay my Epitaph stuff. Uh, at a certain point, I said, well, I want to launch my own label now. I've learned some things at Epitaph. Let me, let me see if I can't be in the driver's seat from the label, label perspective. Did that for a while. Uh, got a, a publishing contract with Rondor. Became a Rondor songwriter. So everything is a step to the next thing. And all the time meeting people. Because uh, in a lot of ways, it's, uh, this is a business of relationships. This is a business of people that you know. 
you know, you have to be qualified. You have to know what you're, you know, in your, your craft, your skill, whatever your skill set is, you, ha you gotta be competent at that. But everybody's competent at that. It's a competitive business. So from there, it's, I met this guy over here. He works at uh, the film studio. I met this guy over there. Somebody called me and asked me to play on a session. I met the guy that produced that. And you start to build up um, the old boy network, which is kind of what you guys are doing here, because as your careers go on and on, you'll all remember each other. And someday, you'll all be executives, and you'll be calling each other up saying, hey, uh, buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell. <laughs> So, so that you know, that's that. It's really, it's it's a it's a just steady on. I, I think the most important thing is uh, your character. Um, that you know that the people that I've met in the 17 years I've been in Los Angeles all think the same thing about me because I'm the same guy to everybody. You know, I try to te te treat people with dignity and respect. And generally, they treat me that way in return. If I'm asked to do something, I get it done. I get it done on time. I get it done on, on budget. So people know I'm solid. And what I, if I say something, pretty much that's the way it's going to go. And I think that's <coughs> important because there's a lot of people that don't deliver. A lot of people say they're going to do something, and they don't do it. And they, that gets sorted out pretty quickly, and they don't get called back. I mean, I, one of my, one of my uh, film scoring classes at, at UCLA, uh, my teacher, who's a working composer in LA, the subject came up and he said, you know, Wayne, he said, there's a lot of guys around LA that are really talented composers, and they'll get a feature film, and then you'll never hear from them again. You know why that is? I said, hmm, I don't know. He said, because they're assholes. <laughs> that, you know, that's it. You know, you want to, people hire people that, that they like to have around, that, that bring something to the table. Well, I guess we've settled it all and you guys are ready for a career. Let's roll. <laughs> yeah, man. advice for young musicians trying to get into the game, trying to have a musical voice for the Well, I, I, I think you have, to lo you have to love what you're doing. You have to love e every aspect of, of the process, you know, of learning music, the, of, of, uh, of, you know, practicing. Uh, I, always, I always wondered how my mother could endure it. You know, I would sit at a record player and I would start the record over again and I'd try to get that Chuck Berry line, you know, and I'd play it again. And I, you know, when you're 13, 14 years old, you're obsessive and, I, you know, I'd play it over and over. And I mean, I just, I didn't know it then, but I look back on it and I think, how could she, geez, I must have, you know, I know now when, I, when I'm going to practice, I close the studio door because I know it's not fun to listen to. You hear somebody go, ba do da do da do clunk. ba do da do da do da do da do da do da clunk. ba do da do da It's terrible. <laughs> but I enjoy it. To me, it's a terrific challenge. So I think you have to enjoy everything about it. You have to enjoy the, you know, <coughs> Uh, promoting your work, you know, you have self-efficacy, you know, the fact that you you think that you have something to say. It's a uh, it requires a great deal of uh, tenacity and uh, and the knowledge that um, most things don't work out. It's just it's very difficult. It's very competitive. I don't know if you read um, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell's new book. You, somebody over here read it. You read it. He talked, he studied how did people succeed. And he talked about musicians. Like he talked about the Beatles. When they were in Liverpool, they were just one of the bands in Liverpool in, in the early 60s. And the, most of the bands would play a 20 minute set. And nobody thought that much of them. Then they started going to Germany to play 
uh, in Hamburg. And when they went to Germany, he tracked exactly how many trips. They did like five trips to Germany. And the first time they played like 120 nights. And the second time they pay, played 70 nights. And then they played 82 nights. And every night they played eight hours a night. And he added it up and they had put in over 10,000 hours on stage playing in front of people. Now, that's what it takes. You know, they had to learn so much music and how to sing together and how to play together and how to entertain people. And uh, he did the same, same, so when they, you know, when they finally hit America, it was like, you know, they were, it was like breathing air for them. They were just dead in their element. They were completely comfortable. They ruled the stage. They owned it. That was their home turf from all the hours that they put in. He said uh, also that he studied classical musicians. And uh, the classical musicians that rehearsed three to 5,000 hours ended up teaching music in school systems. The ones that practiced uh, four to 8,000 hours uh, ended up as working like symphony players, working musicians. And the ones that practiced 10,000 hours and more became world-class soloists. So, a lot of it is perspiration, not, not inspiration. I, I think you got to, you know, put the work in, and uh, and and it's a, you know, it's tough. It's hard. I mean, it's it's not a it's not a it's not an easy undertaking. I don't want to I don't want to discourage you though. <laughs> Maybe I do a little bit, but but. Uh, you know, it's also incredibly rewarding. Uh, it can have some incredible uh, gifts that come, come from a career in the arts. You certainly get, hopefully, you get to make some contribution to the culture. You know, you get to, you get to tell some stories. You get to carry some messages, some ideas. And that helps people. And I, I think that's, that has meaning. I think that has value, you know. Uh, 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 there are, you know, needless to say, uh, a lot of fringe benefits. Um, some good, some not so good. But, you know, you're human and you want to get out there and chase girls or chase boys or whatever. Um, I mean, that's one of the reasons I, I like playing in bands, you know. I mean, it, w it was absolutely a way to um, get laid, often. I just don't want to soft pedal that, you know. That's that's a real thing. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, can you just go through like a specific gig um, in like a facility that that just like just kept you there? On tour? Yeah. Sure. There's, there's, um, there's bus touring, which the way that day goes is you wake up uh, on the bus in, in the next city, generally outside the venue or in the hotel parking lot. And uh, you uh, figure out how to get cleaned up, because you can't shower on the bus. So sometimes it, we'll have a couple hotel rooms for people to go up and shower. Then uh, uh, you got to get to the venue, do the sound check. Uh, there may be press meetings in between where you're going to go sit and talk to a journalist. Or depending on the level, you might go over and do a television show, or you might be talking to a fanzine. I mean, uh, it's all pu pu same thing. Um, then it's uh, play the show and uh, get in the bus and go to sleep, and then do it again. And you know, I've done these kinds of tours where you do that for 30 days in a row. And it's, it can get to be um, pretty strange. Uh, laundry is a, a big issue, because your clothes get pretty stinky you know, after a while. So you know, finding hotels that have uh, wash machines, or I mean, if you're a big band, you know, then you have assistants that want launder your clothes for you. But most working musicians, those are the kinds of things 
the guys that aren't the leader of the band, you know, like that are just in the band, that are on tour, that's kind of what their day is like. If you're not in the bus, then you're at the motel or the hotel, and it doesn't matter if you're the Rolling Stones or you're um, the chairs. Uh, you're going to wake up somewhere, you're going to have to eat, get yourself fed, you're going to get in the bus, van, car, station wagon, whatever it is. You're going to drive for a long time. You're going to stop at crappy food and eat crappy food. And then you're going to get to the venue. You're going to do the sound check. You're going to play the show. And then you're going to go to the hotel, and you're going to do the same thing again tomorrow. It's really it's exciting and fun when you're young and you're looking to meet girls and get high. It's terrific for that. but it. But my experience, and guys I know, I mean, I've watched lots of young guys, and they really love it for about five years. And after about five years of going from the Motel 6 to the van to the some sh punk rock shithole, <laughs> they get over it, you know? They just get tired of it, you know? They get tired of being broke because there's no money in it, you know? You're, you're lucky to pay the expenses to get to the next gig. You're doing it because you want to be on stage in front of people. That's, that's the payoff. That's why you're doing it. And to, you know, how that translates into moving up the ladder into nicer hotels and, <coughs> and better food uh, and, uh, is, is the, you know, that's, that's the, uh, the, the goal of the industry, you know, to move up into the moneyed levels. But, you know, that's what it's like. The thing is, it's the same. It's just a little bit less uncomfortable on the Rolling Stones level than it is on the, on the chairs level, the punk rock level. But you still got to do the same thing. You got to travel, you got to do the show, and then you got to do it again tomorrow. It's, 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 it's kind of a, it's a troubadour existence. You know, you can romanticize it, but really it's kind of a it's, it's not much fun after, after a while. I mean, I'm surprised. Bob Dylan is still on tour all the time. I mean, he loves it. He's just he's comfortable at his age going from the hotel to the venue and to the bus. And bless him for it, you know. I, I personally, you know, it's why I like doing film and TV, because I can go to the studio every day. And then I can go home and sleep in my own bed with my own wife. And I can eat my own food. <laughs> it just makes more sense for me. I mean, I, you know, I, I wouldn't impose that on anyone else. But uh, in, in sort of a general question, I don't know what sort of trends you've noticed in what particular fields, but uh, where do you see things going? I mean, uh, Professor Snyder is always telling us um, long tail, George Howard. The tipping point, like things are changing, no barriers to entry. Um, what are some of the things that you see happening that, that you're like, that's going to be really nice in five years? How I think this business of show is changing? Well, needless to say, the, the internets are affecting it. <laughs> but I don't know that that. I, I, if I pull back and look over the long course of history, people have always needed entertainment. They've always needed songs and stories. And so what we're talking about a lot is the delivery system. You know, how, how, how is this entertainment being delivered? And uh, clearly the, the, um, the World Wide Web is, is going to be the uh, the pipeline. Uh, there's, a, there's a big problem getting paid. And uh, me and a few of my uh, composer friends in LA have, have a crackpot theory about that. And that is that the ISPs need to be paying us. In any criminal investigation, they always tell you, follow the money. Well, where's the money in the internet? It's not in downloads. <laughs> it's just not YouTube, the, I mean, iTunes is a joke, you know. The artists aren't making, they're making less money. 
Everybody's sharing music. In fact, we pr we're proposing a day of sharing in November, International Day of Sharing. Just like we share this beautiful music, we should all go to the supermarket and share in the groceries. Just get a couple bags of groceries, load them up and say, thanks, I'm sharing, and walk out the door. Go to a restaurant, order a nice meal. <laughs> no, I'm sharing it. I mean, in fact, order the meal for somebody else. Give it to someone homeless and share it with them. Go to uh, fill up your t car with gas and tell the gas station guy, I'm, I'm sharing the gas today. Sharing, day of sharing. <laughs> Go to a Mercedes dealer. <laughs> tell him you're sharing that new coupe. So I think it's the ISPs. I think the ISPs, they're the ones that are, last year was uh, $91 billion. Uh, it, our DSL bills, cable TV bills, cell phone bills, that's where the money is. That's, and I think this has to start at the top in legislation. This is almost impossible to do, but uh, that the law requires that the ISPs carve out a piece of that money on a scale commensurate it with the artist's work that is being um, shared. Then give it all away. Didn't they kind of do that with, uh, with uh, video, uh, like like VCRs and stuff? Would they charge them um, some, some rate, like, like a like a fee that they would split among the artists and recommendations? I think they tried it. Yeah, yeah. The Canadians have a have this plan and. Uh, that's working its way through the Canadian courts right now, and it, it's pretty sensible. So we'll see y'all on, on Wednesday. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.